Thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, very much appreciated for taking us through uh, the lens of uh, uh, India uh, and uh, a little snapshot of what's to come uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, I think uh, what resonates is that to be able to further our democracy, we have to be willing to debate it. Uh, that uh, resonated strongly. I'd like now to introduce the Honourable Chris Bowen, uh, Minister for Climate Change and Energy. After entering Parliament in 2004, the Minister has held a wide range of portfolios, including serving as Treasurer, Minister for Human Services, Minister for Immigration and Minister for Small Business. Both climate change and energy are, of course, increasingly portfolios that play dual domestic and international roles, vital for our global partnerships and a key feature of conflict, as we're seeing in Russia's war on Ukraine. So it is a pleasure to ask, the Minister, to ask Minister Bowen to provide his remarks. Thank you very much. Outside that window, uh, 235 years ago, 11 ships sailed through those magnificent heads. And the lives of a woman called Barangaroo, who we now honour just near here, and her husband, Ben Along, who's honoured by the name across the way, changed forever. And the lives of all our First Nations people changed forever on that day, which we must acknowledge as we celebrate their elders past, present and emerging. And of course, later this year, our country will have the opportunity for our most important ever act of reconciliation, recognising our first peoples in our constitution and providing them with an enshrined voice to parliament. And that's an opportunity for Australia to show ourselves and to show the world that modern Australia honours and cherishes our first peoples. And it's important to our country to partner with them as we work to eradicate disadvantage. Well, thank you, uh, ASPE and uh, ORF, for uh, convening this important and inaugural uh, Raisina at Sydney Dialogue. And at the outset, can I uh, acknowledge uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Jaishankar. Now, Dr. Jaishankar, uh, you are not only the foreign minister of an important friend, but you should be acknowledged as one of the most thoughtful and impactful thinkers and thought matters on matters relating to our complicated region. We've heard some of those thoughts today. And your book, The India Way, Strategies for uh, an Uncertain World, is important, not just, not, is important not just for those of us with a deep interest in India, but all of us with an interest in the role of middle powers in a time of bipolar geopolitical contest. So if you haven't read Dr. Jai Shankar's book, I highly recommend it. It's a very good read. And the fact that this is your second visit to Australia in just six months, I think underlines the importance you place on the relationship, which we deeply respect and we deeply acknowledge. The Prime Minister is very much looking forward to his bilateral visit to India in March. And I predict discussions on climate and energy will figure prominently in discussions between Prime Minister Modi and Prime Minister Albanese, which of course I'll very much welcome. Now, this is an excellent year for India to chair the G20, and from my point of view, importantly, also chair the Clean Energy Ministerial, an important partnership of the world's key economies working together to accelerate the global energy transformation. It's a very important meeting. 6,000 delegates uh, usually attend the Clean Energy Ministerial. It'll be a very big meeting. Now, there's some disagreement among statisticians about whether India has just become the world's most populous nation or is about to become the world's most populous nation in the next month or so. But either way, India is taking its place at the top of the global population mountain. And the theme of India's G20 presidency, Vasudheva Kudumpakram, One Earth, One Family, One Future, to me is an indication of the importance India is going to place on an inter interconnected sustainability. And of course, there's no more important element to interconnected sustainability than ensuring that we are tackling climate change. And I want to acknowledge the enormous effort that I know uh, India is putting into the meeting of the first energy transition working group. My officials just returned from India just this last week for planning meetings and they've reported to me just how much effort, uh, as we would know and expect, G20 uh, Chair India is putting into their role as host. And I'm very much looking forward to attending not only the Clean Energy Ministerial and G20 Energy Ministers meeting in Goa, uh, but also the G20 Environmental Ministers stream in Chennai a little while afterwards. And I want to make this point very clearly, as I have directly with Minister Jaishenka earlier. There is no stronger supporter 
of G20 chairmanship by India than Australia. We will support you in every way possible and partnership with you, in partnership with you in this important role. And I welcome Minister Puri's message at the India Energy Week just last week that India will use the presidency not only to give resonance to the voice of developing and underdeveloped countries, but also, and I quote, highlight the common concerns of energy security, energy justice and sustainable energy, energy transition so that developing countries can gain reliable and clean energy. And of course, we very much welcome that because when it comes to the response to the climate crisis and the massive energy transformation, I see Australia and India as key and increasingly important partners. The partnership has already begun. I had the privilege of co-chairing with Minister Bupenda Yadav the climate finance negotiations at COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh, a critical piece of work, and I'm glad we were able to make some progress, Minister Yadav and I, in chairing those conversations. And Energy Minister R.K. Singh came to Australia just six months ago, very shortly after our election. I think he was my first bilateral visitor, uh, and he attended the Sydney Energy Forum. And we also engaged in the first ever Quad Energy Ministers meeting during his presence. And I was impressed by RK's incredible focus and thought leadership on the important matter of improving solar panel efficiency. Uh, he's very passionate about it and it's very critical to ensuring that we take the resources we have and make sure that they are working to maximum capacity. I was very pleased to be able to take RK and give him a tour and to show off uh, the Australian ingenuity at the birthplace of the modern solar panel in Randwick. Uh, the University of New South Wales School of Photovoltaic and Renewable Energy. And I know he was impressed. He's raised it with me when I've seen him since in other international meetings. So India's chairmanship of the G20 and hosting the CEM is an important, to take our, important opportunity to take our partnership and speaking frankly, India's level of climate leadership to new levels. And uh, Fatih Barol uh, made this point just last week on his visit uh, to India. He's of course the president of the International Energy Agency and he said India can help drive the global energy agenda on clean energy transitions and energy security with its focus on addressing techn technology gaps and ensuring diversified supply chains, scaling up clean fuels for the future and mobilising investment. Now, I'd like to, in the time available to me today, focus on two matters which I think will be very important for the world this year, very important for Australia, very important for India's chairmanship of G20 and important for both our countries. And that's the urgent need for collaboration between all like-minded countries on renewable energy supply chains. The Minister referred to this in his remarks. And secondly, I want to touch briefly on what I regard as the equally urgent need for a greater effort from our, our multilateral development banks on climate financing. Now, the nexus between the global energy crisis sparked by Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the significant and urgent need to scale up renewable energy production and capacity in the coming years both serve as an important backdrop for today's discussion and indeed for the meetings that are going to occur this year. But equally, we need more than ever strong and resilient supply chains. And I'll be very frank, we can't swap what has been in some parts of the world an over-reliance on one form of energy, gas from Russia, with an over-concentration on renewable energy supply chains which are geographically concentrated as well. That would be a backward step. Energy security requires supply chain security, and with that means resilient and diverse clean energy supply chains accompanied by a diversity of potential suppliers. Now, I want to make it very clear, and I want to make it uh, simple. In Australia, we want to manufacture more things, more elements in the renewable energy supply chain, more solar panels, more inverters, more transformers, more batteries, uh, all the above. But we also want India doing the same, and we very much welcome India's efforts under Prime Minister Modi to do just that, because we need trusted and reliable trading partners being more active in manufacturing of the energy supply chain, and India is a trusted and reliable trading partner par excellence. It's in all our interest to make this a reality, so we all need to be stepping up. Uh, and I know it will feature prominently in the Quad Energy Ministers meetings, discussions we'll be having this year. It featured prominently in our first ever meeting of Quad Energy Ministers last year. I know uh, it will figure in all the discussions and we will welcome and support sensible discussions about diversification of renewable energy supply chains through the G20. Now, as I've noted, the transformation to becoming a renewable, energy economy, a renewable economy around the world is the biggest 
economic change since the Industrial Revolution. But we're undertaking this transformation more quickly than our forefathers had to do, to have the best chance of holding the world as close as possible to 1.5 degrees of warming we need to maximise emissions reduction between now and 2030. Now friends, 2030 might seem like a long way away. It is 83 months away. That is not long. To engineer this massive economic transformation in this short period of time, we are going to need to be all in. Governments of all levels, national, regional and local, that's certainly the case in Australia and I believe the case in India, civil society, trade unions, industry, all of us coming together on this massive transformation. But importantly also, multilateral development organisations. Multilateral development banks cannot be passengers on this journey. We need them stepping up much more. At COP27 in Egypt, in my national statement, I made the point that our international financial architecture was built for a different time and is in need of modernisation. And I was pleased that the cover decision from Sharm El Sheikh reflected this and included a reference to multilateral development banks to define a new model fit for purpose of addressing the climate emergency. This reflects the growing calls for change, perhaps best exemplified by the Prime Minister of Barbados and her important Bridgetown initiative. These are important words, but this year we have to see more than words. We need to see action, we need to see progress. And I think countries like Australia and India can play an important role in bringing the passion and the thoughts behind things like the Bridgetown Initiative to ensure practical, achievable steps forward in multilateral development bank reform. In particular, while public sector investment is important, it's more impactful if it leverages additional private sector investment. Now in 2021, every dollar of climate finance created by an MDB generated 25%, 25 cents of new private finance. For every $1, they generated 25 cents of private finance. Surely we can do better than that. Surely they can leverage more private sector investment than that. So again, I think countries like Australia and India with our different perspectives uh, can work together to develop and promote practical, achievable and verifiable improvements to the way MDBs do their work. Now, I've been impressed. It's important we don't overgeneralise. I've been very impressed by the work of the Asian Development Bank working across our region on the energy transition, but we have not seen, and we need to be frank, that level of commitment from other multilateral development banks. Now, I note the news this week that the current president of the World Bank will leave his position early. This provides an opportunity to reset the leadership of the bank and ensure the centrality of the climate challenge at the core of their work. Now, of course, neither the G20 nor the COP are decision makers when it comes to MDB governance. That's a matter for their respective boards. But both the G20 and the COP are unparalleled opportunities for like-minded countries to make their views and expectations crystal clear. And we expect MDBs to be stepping up to the task and we expect to see real action from MDBs to improve on this, the most important matter on the global agenda. So friends, in conclusion, when I first visited India, in 1998 as a tourist, I fell in love with the country. I have to be honest with you and say I've been back so many times that I have honestly lost count. I don't know how many times I've been back. It's into double figures, I know that. But when I was first in Goa 25 years ago, while I knew I'd be returning often to India, little did I realise or contemplate or imagine that 25 years later I'd be back in Goa collaborating with the Indian Minister on the challenges of our time. We know, that is the Indian and Australian governments, how high the stakes are. We know it, we've lived it. We've both been ravaged by natural disasters in recent times. Last year, India saw extreme weather events across the country during 80% of the year, including the May floods, which caused the loss of life and significant crops. In Australia, 68% of Australians were living in an area covered by a natural disaster declaration in 2022 at some point. 68% of our population at some point covered by a natural disaster declaration, with some of the areas experiencing back-to-back -back multiple declarations time after time, and some areas hit by bushfires and then floods. 
So our nations don't know, our nations don't just know what will happen if we don't act on climate change. We know that those impacts are here and the live reality now, and that makes the case for action ever, ever more urgent. Natural disasters are becoming more severe, more frequent, and increasingly less natural. And of course, that's before we even get to the matter of daily heat. Both our countries have a beautiful uh, environment, but rising heat and prolonged heat waves have huge health implications, particularly for our elderly and less well off, who can't live, can't afford air conditioning, uh, live in areas where heat waves are being experienced for longer and longer. And that has its biggest impact on our elderly and most vulnerable. So we all have an imperative for action. We have the reason, we have the will, and with the ability to collaborate. And 2023 will be a key year for collaboration between India and Australia. And I look forward to doing much more of that this year. Thank you for your time.